field sobriety tests, preliminary breath tests. Police body cameras and dashboard cameras record the results of these tests every day across our country. They can give the police the observation they need to place you under arrest for driving under the influence or driving while intoxicated. It usually starts with an officer asking you, please step out of your vehicle. And due to a 1977 Supreme Court case called Pennsylvania v. Mims, you do have to comply with such a request. But do you have to agree to the field sobriety test or the roadside breath test? This encounter between Rayshard Brooks and Atlanta police in June of 2020 can be instructive. Hold on, Mr. Brooks. Will you take a preliminary breath test for me? It's yes or no. I don't want to refuse anything. Uh, it's yes or no. It's completely up to you. Yes, I will. Okay, just wait here while I grab. Did you catch that? Brooks said that he didn't want to refuse anything. The way he said it shows that he believes that if he were to refuse, something bad would happen to him. And the officer's response? It's up to you. Totally inadequate. He didn't tell Brooks what could happen if he took the test or what consequences, if any, he would face if he refused it. Now, we all know that something bad, really bad, did happen to him despite his agreement to take the test. But this interchange with the Atlanta police officers does raise some questions. Do we have to agree to take field sobriety tests? Do we have to agree to those roadside breath tests? It's drilled in our head that driving is a privilege, and because of that, we give up certain rights in order to engage in the privilege of driving. But does it mean we have to blow into that little device the police officer carries with him and let him determine right there what our blood alcohol content is? The answer may surprise you. There are two things I want to say up front. The first is that I'm a Virginia lawyer, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is Virginia law. I will have some examples from other states, but if you have questions about the law in other states, you should consult a lawyer from that state. Second, don't take what I say on this video as legal advice. Legal advice requires you to disclose all of the facts relevant to your circumstances to a lawyer and letting that lawyer analyze the facts and tell you how the law applies to you. This video is for informational purposes only. Okay, so you get pulled over and a police officer asks you, do you mind taking some tests for me? Will you take a breath test? Sometimes they don't even give you a choice. They ask you to get out of the car and then they say, now I'm going to perform some sobriety tests. And you do it. But even if they do ask, you think that it's a trap. What if I say no? Doesn't that mean that I face tons of really bad consequences for my license and maybe even go to jail? We're not allowed to refuse the breathalyzer test, right? I mean, driving's a privilege, not a right. Things that aren't reasonable in other contexts, well, they're reasonable in the driving context. And you think bad things are going to happen to you if you refuse. So, you say yes. But is that the right answer? So normally, to seize evidence, and that's what the police officer is doing when he asks you to take a breath test. He's seizing evidence. To seize evidence, a police officer needs a search warrant. Now there's some exception to the rule that requires a search warrant, and some of those exceptions apply to cars. Nonetheless, the police can't search your car without a reason. To search the inside of your car without a warrant, well, the police need either probable cause or to believe that their safety is in jeopardy. So if you have something on your seat, well, then you're in trouble. They can look at your car from the outside. That's called the plain sight doctrine. A major exception to the search warrant requirement is when a person gives consent. So the officer asks you, may I search your car? And you say yes. Well, you've just consented to the search. But for consent to be valid, it needs to be voluntary. Well, what does voluntary mean? Do you need to know what your rights are? Do you need to know that you've got the right to refuse? Do you need to know that you can say no? In the Fifth Amendment context, those questions have been answered. The Fifth Amendment protects against self-incrimination. The key language of the Fifth Amendment is that no person, 
shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. The key case that everybody knows in the Fifth Amendment context is the Miranda case. You can see the police reciting Miranda warnings on TV, for example, all the time. The Miranda case tells us that the right against self-incrimination is so important that when you're placed under arrest, the police officers have to read you your Miranda warnings. That is, they have to tell you what your rights are, that you are allowed to remain silent, and that if you don't remain silent, anything you say can be used as evidence against you in order to prove your guilt. In fact, the right against self-incrimination is so important that not only are you guaranteed the right to be silent, you're guaranteed the ability to speak to a lawyer about your right to be silent before you talk to the police. And this is a right to a lawyer that's over and above the Sixth Amendment right to counsel. So the police must inform you of your rights to let you know that you can refuse the talk before you can voluntarily waive those rights. But does this all apply when you've consented to take a breath test? In order for your consent to take a breath test or any field sobriety test to be valid, do you need to know whether you can refuse? So let's take a look at the Supreme Court case of Sneckla versus Bustamante. This was a case that involved a car search. There were a couple of passengers in the car. The police stopped the car. They asked the passengers if they could search. Somebody said yes. And in the end, Bustamante is the one who got charged with possession of marijuana. And the rule from Bustamante is that in order for a consent to searching the car to be valid, it needs to be voluntary. And voluntariness is determined by looking at the totality of the circumstances. That is, looking at all the facts that's involved with giving consent. It can include factors such as how old is the suspect? What's the education level of the suspect? Has the suspect been advised of his rights? How long has the questioning been going on? Has there been any physical punishment or the threat of any physical punishment? But the state does not have to prove that it specifically told the defendant that he had the right to refuse. So unlike the Miranda context, when it comes to a search and seizure, the police officers can get your consent and they need it to be voluntary, but it doesn't mean that they need to tell you that you have the right to refuse. But hold on. Just because a police officer doesn't have to tell you that you have the right to refuse, it doesn't mean that that's not going to be one of the factors that the court considers when looking at the totality of the circumstances. And yes, I get it. This is all very confusing. Many police officers, for example, will look at Bustamante and what they'll take away from it is, well, I don't have to tell the guy that he can refuse. I can simply ask, will you let me search the car? And technically, that may be true. But that doesn't mean that when you've given consent, it's automatically valid, even though the police haven't informed you that you could say no. Whether the police informed you of your rights is just going to be one factor that's going to be considered in determining voluntariness. And notice the strict contrast between the Fourth Amendment, which is the amendment that covers search and seizure law, and the Fifth Amendment, which covers self-incrimination. It begs the question, are breath tests and roadside sobriety tests covered by the Fourth Amendment? Or are they covered by the Fifth Amendment? Is it a search and seizure? Or is it testimony or self-incriminating evidence? And we'll get to that in a minute. Right now, let's stay on the topic of what your rights are. Are you allowed to refuse a roadside breath test or roadside sobriety tests? Before we get into this, we need to be careful about our terms. So we have our sobriety tests. Those are the tests like close your eyes and touch your nose, say the alphabet backwards, can you walk in a straight line, can you balance on one foot. Then we have the roadside breath test. And many of us may use the term breathalyzer very broadly. And when you think of a breathalyzer, you may think of that device that the police carries with him that you blow into on the side of the road. And is that roadside breath test the test that we're not allowed to refuse? But the thing is, there are two types of breath tests. There's the test by the side of the road, and that can go by a number of different names. 
It can be called the preliminary breath test or the PBT. It can be called the ALCO sensor, an alcohol screening test, maybe even a backtrack test. All of that is referring to that handheld device that the police carry with them in their car and that they bring out and they tell you, go ahead, blow into this. And that handheld test, the preliminary breath test, well, that doesn't have the same requirements for calibration and maintenance that an actual breathalyzer has. And that is the second breath test, the official breathalyzer. The official breathalyzer is kept at the police station. It needs to be maintained on a regular basis. It needs to be calibrated on a regular basis. And that breathalyzer that's permanently at the police station, that's the test that gives you the more accurate assessment of what your blood alcohol level is. In Virginia, whether you have the right to refuse depends upon which test you're being asked to take and the reason you're asked to take the test. So let's look to the Code of Virginia, section 18.2, 267.C. Any person who has been stopped by a police officer of the Commonwealth, or of any county, city, or town, or any other member of a sheriff's department, and is suspected by such officer to be guilty of an offense listed in, and these are the DUI offenses, shall have the right to refuse to permit his breath to be so analyzed, and his failure to permit such analysis shall not be used as evidence in any prosecution for an offense listed in subsection A. And once again, those are the DUI type offenses. So if a police officer suspects that you've been driving under the influence, you can refuse the preliminary breath test taken at the side of the road. And your refusal to take that test cannot be used against you. In fact, the results of that preliminary breath test are not admissible in a court of law if you've been charged with a DUI. And that's stated explicitly in the Virginia Code, section 18.2-267E. So, you mean to tell me that in Virginia, if I'm pulled over, not only do I have the right to refuse to take a breath test, but that the Virginia legislature distrusts these breath tests so much that the results of them are not admissible in a court of law? Yes, you have every right to refuse a field sobriety test or a preliminary breath test, and you will face no legal consequences, at least in Virginia. In fact, Virginia police officers are required to tell you this before you agree to a preliminary breath test. And this comes from the Code of Virginia 18.2-267.F. Police officers or member of any sheriff's department shall, upon stopping any person suspected of committing an offense listed in subsection A, advise the person of his rights under the provisions of this section. In fact, if you agree to one of these preliminary breath tests, the results can be used to create reasonable suspicion that you've been driving under the influence, and it can be used as the basis for an arrest. And you can find that in the Virginia Code, section 18.2-267D. By agreeing to the roadside preliminary breath test, what you're doing is giving the police officer the reasonable suspicion that he needs in order to arrest you. So in Virginia, if you're being pulled over by a police officer, and if the officer asks you, will you take some field sobriety tests, or will you take the preliminary breath test, the answer should always be no. But notice that if you do consent to a roadside preliminary breath test, you do have the right to observe how the test is being performed. And that comes from the Code of Virginia, section 18.2-267A. Now the answer is very different if you're being arrested for a DUI. And that can be found in the Virginia Code, section 18.2-268.2A. This is where you remember that driving is a privilege. So by driving in Virginia, and it doesn't matter if you're licensed in Virginia or if you're licensed in some other state, just by virtue of driving on the roads of Virginia, 
the law implies that you've given consent to a breath test, a blood test, or a urine test, and this is called implied consent. But it depends on two factors. The first factor is, have you been arrested? And the second factor, is this the official breathalyzer test at the police station? Or is this a blood or urine test? So if those two factors are met, if you're actually under arrest for a DUI, and if we're talking about the official breathalyzer or a blood or urine test, then you are presumed to have consented, and if you refuse, that's when the bad things can happen to you. But it bears emphasis. This is a different test. This is not that roadside portable preliminary breath test, or the PBT. This is the official breathalyzer, the machine that's at the police station, and sometimes it has a printout. Now here are some of the rules of the breathalyzer. It needs to be taken within three hours of your arrest. You have the right to observe how it's being done, and if the machine gives a printout, you have a right to keep a copy of that printout. And as I said, this is the test where if you refuse it, then you have the bad consequences that follow. So for a first offense, your driver's license is going to be suspended for a year. Your refusal can be used against you as evidence of a guilty conscience. That means it can imply that you know you're guilty. And if you refuse, and this is not your first refusal, or if you have one of those DUI-type offenses on your record within the past 10 years, then your refusal to take the breathalyzer or a blood test is a Class 1 misdemeanor. That means it's punishable by up to a year in jail, or a $2,500 fine, or it could be punishable by both. Moreover, this conviction would be a three-year suspension on your license to drive. Our neighbors to the west, Kentucky, has a similar setup. If you're not under arrest, you can refuse the roadside preliminary breath test. Plus, your refusal to take the preliminary breath test is not admissible against you on a charge of DUI. But, after an arrest, consent is implied. And, your refusal to take a breathalyzer or a blood or urine test can be used against you as evidence of your guilt. Moreover, such refusals can result in the suspension of your license. Pennsylvania has a law that has similar language to that used in Kentucky. Now, in Michigan, an officer can insist that you take a roadside sobriety test if they have reasonable suspicion that you've been driving under the influence. So they can require you to do the roadside sobriety test or the preliminary breath test before there's been an arrest. But if you refuse in Michigan, it's only a civil infraction. This is police body cam footage of an accident where New Jersey Assemblywoman Maria Rodriguez Gregg was rear-ended in 2017. I'm not going to let you hear the audio because the assemblywoman's response was quite profanity-laden. This video serves as a good opportunity to point out how the law in New Jersey operates differently from the jurisdiction we've already mentioned. As the assemblywoman found out, in New Jersey, the police officers may require you to take roadside sobriety tests if he or she has a reasonable suspicion that you have been driving while impaired. In this case, the officers claimed that they smelled marijuana, and as it turned out, she had no marijuana in her system. Nonetheless, she resisted officers when asked to get out of the car and when the officers started field sobriety tests. In New Jersey, that can be the basis for a charge of obstruction of the administration of law, New Jersey's version of obstruction of justice. As I understand it, her case is still pending, but after this video was made public, the assemblywoman chose not to run for re-election. Okay, remember back in the beginning I said we were begging the question that a breath test or a blood test was covered by the Fourth Amendment and not the Fifth? Well, in Virginia, that question has been answered. The case comes from the Virginia Court of Appeals, it's Rowley v. Commonwealth. And the Virginia Court of Appeals looked at the text of the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And that language says that a criminal defendant cannot be forced to be a witness against himself. So the Virginia Court of Appeals looked at that language and said that the right against self-incrimination is limited to testimony or 
testimonial-like evidence. So, exhibiting certain physical characteristics is not testimonial in nature and therefore not covered by the Fifth Amendment. So, for example, let's say you're in a criminal trial and let's say that the prosecutor wants you to put on a hat because it was the same hat that the person who committed the crime was wearing. Well, in Virginia, the fact that you may look like the person who committed the crime if you wear the hat is not something that's protected by the Fifth Amendment you would have to wear the hat. Or if there is some other kind of demonstration that would show you look like the person who committed the crime. Well, blood and breath, they're not testimonial evidence. And therefore, Virginia's statutory scheme, where they can use against you the fact that you refuse to do a blood test or an official breathalyzer test, that, the Virginia courts say, is constitutional. And most states answer the question the same way that Virginia does. And that is that the results of a breathalyzer or a blood test are not testimonial in nature, and therefore they're not protected by the Fifth Amendment. One state does not. And that is Georgia. Now, I'll tell you, when I found out about this, I was quite surprised. You see, back when I was going to college, I came from Philadelphia and I was going to college at the University of Miami. And every semester I would drive down to the university or I would drive from Florida back up to Philly. And I was always warned by older drivers that there were two states in particular that I had to be careful in. And those were South Carolina and Georgia. In fact, if you were a member of AAA, well then you can go into a AAA office and you could get a trip map. When they gave you that trip map, it was like a, a book with a spiral backing and you could flip over and you can see the next section of the map and that's how you could follow where you were going. You know, back before there was stuff like GPS. And the AAA employees would stamp in those areas where they knew that the law was strictly enforced. And there was always a stamp in South Carolina and Georgia. So Georgia's approach to taking a breathalyzer blew my mind. And that's because Georgia interprets its state constitutional protections against self-incrimination broader than the federal protection under the Fifth Amendment. And remember, states can do that. States can give you more rights than the federal constitution, but they can't give you less. In fact, the Georgia Constitution is worded differently. It uses the phrase self-incrimination as opposed to phrases like testify against himself or be a witness against himself. Now, the Georgia Supreme Court, they said that the difference in language between the federal constitution and the Georgia Constitution really didn't matter. What they did is they went back and they did a historical review of what it means to be protected against self-incrimination. And they said that back in 1877, which is when the current language that's in the Georgia Constitution was adopted, that the right against self-incrimination was broader than just merely testimonial protection. And that is the right against self-incrimination also included certain incriminating acts. You had the right to refuse to turn over papers, for example, or documents. You also had the right to refuse to do something like put a hat on in court or some other in-court comparison that would make you look like the person who committed the crime. So Georgia says that if you refuse to take the official breathalyzer, that means the official machine in the police station that's maintained and calibrated. If you refuse to take the breathalyzer, then in Georgia, that refusal cannot be used against you in a criminal case. So yeah, Georgia is the outlier. Okay, let's sum it all up. Let's talk about what a traffic stop by the police should look like. First and foremost, be polite. In many cases, if you fight the ticket, you'll see that the police officer is taking notes. And a police officer can make a note like, don't give this guy a deal, he wasn't cooperative. And generally, a prosecutor is going to honor that. Firmly, but politely, insist on your rights. In most states, your rights are going to key off of whether or not the officer has arrested you. Whether you're under arrest will decide whether your refusal to do something will follow with consequences. In most states, you have no reason to agree to roadside sobriety tests.
and remember the difference between the preliminary breath test and the official breathalyzer at the police station. And if you do get in trouble with the police, call a lawyer. Tell the lawyer your facts and circumstances so you can get the most accurate legal advice. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. If there are any topics you would like me to address in the future, please let me know in the comments below. Now, I don't like talking about this, but I am currently disabled because of complications following cancer surgery. If you're feeling generous, I'll have a link to my PayPal account in the description below. Thank you.